This video is going to walk through the TIPS problem solving model using an academic problem. Just as we did with our behavior, we're going to start off with problem identification. After first confirming that we do have a problem worthy of our attention, we're going to work to define that problem with our precision elements of what, who, when, where, and why. We then are going to decide at what point would this no longer be a problem as we identify a goal for change. Once a goal is in place, we'll have enough information along with our precision elements to identify the most appropriate solution to put in place and also develop our implementation plan with our process for gathering outcome data and fidelity information. We then will put our solutions in place, gather data, so we can ask the question first of all, did we do what we said we were going to be doing? And then, have we reached the goal? Has the problem been solved? Based from our data from that, we're then going to determine our next steps, which may include walking through again our problem identification cycle. So let's take a look at an academic example. Our first step, of course, is going to be problem identification and asking the question of, do we have a problem? Is there a difference between what we see and what we want to see or observed and expected? Our expected guidelines within our data will come from different academic sources, such as national medians, expectations, or district-defined goals for students. Academic expectations can come from many different data sources. Curriculum-based measurements, we might want to use the 50th percentile on national norms. Sometimes we use risk indicators, wanting our students to be in a low-risk zone. If we're taking a bigger picture look at the school, we often use the ideal that we want 80% of our students to be meeting that expectation. Now, once we have defined that there is that discrepancy, between what we expect and what we observe, our next question is going to be, what do we do next? Is this a point which we can already start talking about solutions? With our behavior data, we used five different precision elements, what, when, where, who, and why. With our academic data set, we often find that we can collapse these in to just what, who, and why. Let's take a look at some primary examples. Carly's having reading difficulties. This is really a statement which doesn't lead us directly to any type of solutions or guidelines. We need to make it much more precise. We can make it a little more precise by saying that now Carly is reading 20 words correctly per minute. We would really like her to be reading 60. She skips or guesses at words she doesn't know, mostly during her language arts class. We can also get more specific by saying Carly cannot decode. She struggles to read words especially those containing R-controlled vowels, digraphs, and long vowels. With this level of precision element, we can now move towards looking at solutions to help Carly reach success. Here's another primary statement. Jack cannot add or subtract. This statement in its present form does not lead us towards specific solutions to put in place. However, when we get more specific with our precision elements, we now start seeing different pathways for possible solutions. We see that he's not fluent in his knowledge of basic math facts and that often does not notice that there's differences between the operations of addition and subtraction. A few more. Our fourth graders are failing district exams in math. We get more specific and we now find out that they're actually not doing as well on the word problems because we believe that they're unfamiliar with all that vocabulary that's embedded within word problems. Another primary statement, some students are falling behind in their early literacy skills. Again, we don't have much direction or guidance for solutions. When we define it more specifically by saying nine of our kindergarten students are not building letter sound correspondence because they're missing those early literacy skills of alliteration, rhyming, segmenting, and blending, we start seeing the strategies we should be thinking about putting in place for these students. So are we ready now to start working with some data? Here's a graph. This is looking at the percentage of students that are meeting expectations in reading comprehension. Is there a problem? 
Let's look more closely. If we go by the general guideline of saying that we want 80% of students to be meeting expectation, let's look more closely at the graph. Do you see a problem? When we look a little more closely at it, we might start being a little concerned with our third graders, getting much more concerned with our fourth graders, and then being very concerned also with fifth graders. We see the trend is going down when we really would want this to be at or above 80%. So our what now becomes reading comprehension. For the rest of this example, we're going to focus just on our fourth graders. So let's start unpacking this a little bit more and pull up our data to look at our particular students. Now again, we're looking at fourth grade. This is a list of students and it's ranked based on whether they're meeting their expectation, whether they're falling in a low risk, some risk, or at an intensive risk zone. It's also color-coded. Green means that students are where they should be. The yellowish kind of beige color are those students that are in that kind of caution zone we need to look at. And the red are the ones that we need to have immediate attention. So let's look more closely. For this particular measure, our expectation is for students to have 14 correct responses. When we look more closely at here, we're going to look towards the students in the yellowish zone, first of all. We happen to notice that all these students are right around that benchmark. So then we move to look a little more closely at the students falling in the intensive support zone. We immediately notice that of these four students, they all do display a significant need for some additional supports or definitely to be considered in problem solving. So we now have defined our who. Next thing we need to look at is why. We can look across many different avenues. One of the more common ones that we look at in academic is looking at the ISIL components or factors over which we typically have control and can modify to help remove barriers to any kind of instruction or skill development. We can look at instruction, how our material and contents delivered, the curriculum, which is actually the material that we are delivering, environmental factors around that, and then also learner factors over which we do have control. We can also look at functional drivers, just like we would do typically with our behavior challenges. Again, with the understanding that people are either acting gain something or to avoid something. And then finally, we can also look at skill development. When we look at how we acquire skills, we know that we process through a stage of first acquiring skills with their accuracy then building fluency so we're not only accurate but we're more rapid. We then move on to where we can generalize a little bit broader and finally to a level of adaptation. All of these components can be considered when we're trying to think about the why for what is maintaining a behavior or a skill at the level it is at. So now let's go back to our example which we know is in the area of reading. We also know that reading does progress along a very particular process. Everything from first being able to play with sounds within words, to be able to link letters to sounds, to be able to read words fluently, and finally to be able to comprehend written text. The whole entire time our vocabulary skills are helping us move along this pathway. If we look at our students that we just looked at, we know that they are faltering in the area of reading comprehension. If we're looking at how skills were required with the knowledge of prerequisite skills, we might have the hypothesis that they're breaking down in the area of being able to read fluently. So let's explore that a little more closely as our possible reason for why. Let's pull up some different data and some different graphs that look at how our four students are reading in the area of reading fluency compared to their peers. These are all box plots. The idea we want to take from looking at these four separate graphs is that the green box reflects the majority of students in that child's grade level. The black line represents the target where we'd expect them to be. When you see the blue dot, that is the particular student. So as we look at all of these graphs, we see that the first one in the upper left-hand corner for John, he's notably below his other peers and also notably below the target for both fall and winter. We look at Marco, similar type thing. Let's go all the way down to the lower right hand corner for Edward. We also see a similar pattern here. These three students all are quite low in their reading fluency. However, when we look at Sally, he was in the lower left hand corner, we notice that 
Her fluency skills are pretty much right on par with the bulk of her peers in her grade level. Based on these data, we can start with a strong hypothesis that our students may be faltering in reading comprehension, at least for our three students, because they're not reading fluently. For Sally, that might not work as well. We need to gather additional data. We gather some data on how her vocabulary skills are established. We know she's a fourth grader, and yet assessment indicates that her vocabulary skills fall around the second grade level. This gives us now another avenue for Sally. Based on these data, what would your precision problem statement be? Let's take a look at one possible precision statement that we could have derived from our data that we just reviewed. This one groups all four students together. Remember, we want to make sure that we're covering all our precision elements. For this one, we're saying that three of the fourth grade students are not comprehending content from written text that's presented at their grade level. These students also have weak reading fluency skills that fall below expectation, and we believe that's why they're faltering in their reading comprehension. A fourth student, remember Sally, also is having difficulty comprehending written text at her grade level, but we believe that her read fluency skills are not the problem. Instead, we believe it's because she's missing a lot of basic vocabulary skills that they're then interfering with her comprehension. We also can put current levels, which tells us where these students are now. This is not only helpful for when we're developing goals, it also gives us a picture of how powerful of a solution we will need to put in place to close that gap. Now, this is one way to put all four students together. It may actually be almost easier if we take these two apart. We take our three fourth grade students, and then we take Sally as a separate unit. There's nothing wrong with keeping these together. It may just be that we have slightly different solutions we want to put in place, or maybe different outcome measures that we want to use to be able to see whether we've been able to increase their skills. Now the next step is once we have our precision statement, we want to take our tips meeting minute form, and we want to go ahead and put them under our new problem sections. Once we've identified the problem with precision, we're going to identify the goal for change. In other words, when will this no longer be a problem? Our expectations will be similar to what we initially held. We can use our district guidelines, we might use national norms, or we might have different benchmarks that our district has already put in place. Let's look at our precision statements. What goals would you write? Here's one possible goal. Inspection of progress monitoring data gathered for reading fluency will document progress towards the target goal. In other words, the data will be at or above the aim line and the trend line will predict closure by the winter benchmark. We have a what and we have a when. May's reading comprehension scores will be at target by winter benchmark. Again, we have a what and we have a when. Let's look at Sally's. For Sally, we also want to address her vocabulary skills. And we're again going to predict that we want them to be closer to our grade level. And our when is by the winter benchmark. Are those like goals that you wrote for them? Now let's add them into the tips meeting minute forms. With our precision statements identified, our goals in place, we now move along to asking what are we going to do to bring about the desired change? What solutions will we put in place? With our PBIS strategies, we often looked across domains of asking questions to prompt us to think about what solutions can be put in place. What should we do in the context to help avoid the problem from ever occurring? What do we need to teach? How can we prime students for the behavior that we want to see how are we going to make sure we're reinforcing the behaviors we want to see and make sure we're not reinforcing the behaviors we don't want to see? And then what kind of consequences might we need to consider? We can use this domain for considering our solutions for academics as well. 
We can also look across our other domains, looking at components of our ISIL, the skill development, or functional drivers to consider solutions that would be appropriate and match our precision elements. Now consider those problems. What would your action plan be? Remember that when we're putting an action plan together, we first have to identify what the solution will be, and then we have to say who is going to do it, and by when are they going to put that in place. Here's some possible solutions we could put in place for our example. And again, as we've done before, once we've identified what we want to put in place, we want to make sure we enter it on our meeting minutes form, and then also identify who's going to put it in place and by what timeline we'd expect that to be in place. Our next step is can we identify our valuation plan, knowing that we need two sources of data. First of all, we need fidelity data that will answer the question of how will we know that we did what we said we were going to be doing. We'll also need outcome data so we can compare our current levels against our goal. So we can answer the question of did we solve the problem? Once we identify those data sources, we're going to enter them again into our tips meeting minutes form. We could look something like this for our example. For our fidelity data, we might ask teachers to answer the question of did you provide instructional level reading material to these students? They then have to rate from one to five whether or not they've done this, either never or all the way up to every opportunity. We're going to gather this monthly. We also might want an attendance log. And we also might want to be able to see some of the permanent products that the students will be producing with their self-monitoring. Our outcome data is going to be looking at those same data sources that we already looked at to establish our current levels. Our curriculum-based measurement in reading comprehension and in reading fluency. Now for Sally, we also are going to want to look at her vocabulary skills. After solutions have been in place and as part of our data-based problem solving, we're going to then examine the impact that our solutions have had. Let's follow our example. Again, just as a refresher, here is what we were putting in place for both our three fourth grade students and for Sally. Here were the fidelity and the outcome measures that we were administering. So let's take a look at some of our data. Here's a fidelity observation completed for the repeated readings intervention. And here's a simple question that was answered as to whether we're implementing the plan. Based on these data, we feel very strongly that we could say that this was implemented with fidelity on our TIPS meeting minute form. Now let's look at the effectiveness of solution. Did we make a difference? Here is sprint benchmark data. Again, did we see gains? Are we reaching 80% of students meeting expectation? We're close. Let's look more closely at our students now. Again, now we're at a slightly higher expectation. When we look at Marco and Edward and John, we've seen notable progress. Sally is still lagging quite a bit behind. Let's look at some more individual progress monitoring graphs. Again, when we inspect the data and its relationship to the aim line and the trend line, we're seeing positive outcomes. However, for Sally, much less. In fact, for Sally, we may need to then process through the problem-solving process again to make sure we have either identified the problem correctly or put the most appropriate solutions in place. Based on these data, for our three students, we've been met the goal. For Sally, we've actually not seen the desired changes that we would like. Problem solving does not stop just after analyzing our data. Based on our data, we have to decide what do we do next? Do we need to modify the solutions, increase them in frequency, duration, or intensity? Do we need to recycle through the problem solving process and potentially realign solutions with precision elements? Have we met our goal? Do we now make plans for how to maintain this over time or as we slowly fade out the supports we put in place? Again, problem solving does not stop 
once we gather our data and continues through the cycle. We hope this has been helpful for you as you can generalize the TIPS problem solving model from just using behavior data to using academic data at levels including students, groups, grade levels, or more.